That'll do it, Pat. That'll do it. Okay. No more of this other rubbish. <laughs> no, not at all. Never a backward step. Never a backward step. Never a backward step. No pee. No pee. No pee. Rooftop to Piccadilly. Is there any sign of him down there, George? Piccadilly to rooftop. It's just getting out. It's just getting out now. Yep, that, that's the one. Okay. All right. Yep. Oh, that's the other way. Wait a minute. Just a gif. Just a gif. Okay. <coughs> The motto of Lord Thompson of Fleet. Perhaps the most powerful press baron the world has ever known adds an electric newscaster to his empire. Driver Charles, ex-army major, barrister at law, and personal assistant to Lord Thompson. Yes. Preview of the London Play Bar Club. Black tie. Yeah. Oh, RAC, everything's there, but the date. Please bring this key with you. The date's on the back here, sir. Wednesday, June 29th, 8:30. Oh, I didn't see that. So either a regret or an acceptance. What, what, what is it a... Uh, well, it's the opening it's of the a, new Bunny's It's just a, Well, I could perhaps make it, you see. I got two hours and a half before I for do those two. 8.30, and the cocktail party with the Bulgarian ambassador. So. It's kind of interesting to see what it's all about. I'm afraid I won't get over to the House of Lords this week. Yeah, it's for Cyrus Eaton. Yeah. It's very nice, very isn't it? Yes, isn't it? Yes, I'm not interested in that. Throw it away. Thompson House. From here, Roy Thompson operates radio and television stations, magazines, newspapers, and book companies in 20 countries. The flagships of the fleet are the Great Times of London and the booming Sunday Times. Let's have your shoes off, love. very tough because uh, how do we create shares I mean without giving away a lot of our equity you see you've got to base it on an existing business you can't create a value and then give shares uh, in trade for new businesses unless it has a basis of a, of a business and where do we get that you see unless we put our American newspapers in which I don't want to do This is a Sunday Times newspaper calling from London. I'm making inquiries about a baby reported missing. Did you say dogs were being used? My French uh -huh. Are we allowed to ask if there's any Oui, c'est assez en mettant parce que c'est trois familles avec des gosses alors. All right, I won't cut the bus off. You're going to ask William. I know what he'll say. In the meantime, we'll put the lines on there. Bon, alors je vous remercie beaucoup. Merci, au revoir, madame. Dear Sid, Sid Chapman, Thanks for your letter of the second instant regarding their preferred shares. I think if we can buy these on the basis mentioned, that we should do so. They could well be purchased through the Royal Bank, so it would not be known that we had bought them. Anna Hagloff. Dear Anna, thanks for your letter. Say, uh, I'd very much like to uh, oblige you by advancing the money to your Muslim friends uh, to uh, start a business, where is it anyway, in, uh, in Jerusalem. You will appreciate that I receive these letters almost every day, and it is entirely impossible for me to accede to such requests. It would be a very doubtful investment. Here's truly. Traditional, yeah. 
rather boring. Should that be there, that shouldn't be there. And I was hoping that Vincent would be strong enough to start on one and turn under Hughes, and one would do Hughes as the big story inside. Yes. We're rather short, aren't we? Good, strong, mm. home news stories this week, relatively. What's the foreign... I've got a message from Peking. Uh, the Peking stuff will, I hope, be lively and actual, and describe mobs in the street or something. Anyway, it'll, it'll uh, have a Peking date line, and that ought to go on the front. I think i better call Isaac in the morning yes. and see if he'll, Excuse you know, me. just make it a quick meeting. His 35,000 employees include some of the finest journalists in the world. Yet he describes news as the stuff you put between the ads and a TV license as a license to print yeah, money. Right. Oh, you say he is the subject of furious controversy. At any given moment, somebody somewhere is talking about Thompson. A member of parliament, a labor peer, and an eminent sociologist. There's a curious succession of waves of Canadian bruisers who come over to the British press, you know, Beaverbrook and that lot. And because we're so badly set up, because we don't know what we're protecting anyway, they can go through it like that. And then a funny thing happens. The British fall over backwards and thank them very much for it. There's a funny kind of way in which we like the colonial to come and be toughened and beat up our press for us. If an Englishman did it, they'd call him vulgar. But look, but let you, it, just a minute, let me finish this one. <coughs> let, a, let a man come in from abroad and do things that, that must take their hair off them in the Athenaeum. And they thank you very much, they say. You've taught us how to run our newspaper. A journalist pub in Fleet Street. And it reminds me of uh, what the society said about Beaverbrook when he first came in 1911. They called him the common little Canadian adventurer. And the proprietors of the day had very much the same view about Thompson then, you know. He was a common little Canadian adventurer. Yes. Colonel of the Toronto Scottish greets his regiment. It's time for our annual pilgrimage to that little spot we have in our hearts, uh, Lord Thompson's favorite joke at New Year's morning. It's the one about the, the Scotsman that went to Paris for a weekend. And he checked in at this little hotel, and the clerk uh, eyed him up and down, and he said, would you like a blonde up in your room? So he said, uh, all right. They had a good time over the weekend. On Monday morning, he said, now I'm checking out. Give me my bill. And the clerk says, always says, there's no bill. So he reached under the counter, the clerk, and he pulled out a 10-pound note, and he handed it to the Scotsman. And he was telling this to a friend. And so uh, the next weekend, the friend's over there. He checks in, and the clerk eyes him up and down, says, would you like a blonde up in your room? He says, oh, yes, yes. So he says, okay. So he sends a blonde up, and they have a good time of the weekend. He comes down Monday morning to check out, and he says, now, he said, my bill. And the clerk says, oh, there's no bill. So the fellow says, oh, that's nice. He waited a minute, nothing else happened, and finally the clerk says, is there something else I can do for you? And he said, well, my friend was here last weekend, and when he checked out, there was no bill, <clears throat> and you gave him 10 pounds. Oh, says the clerk, that's different. He says, last weekend, you see, your friend was live on television. This week, he says, we just took some stills of you. <laughs> But you had a little bit to your right, and a tiny bit up. Oh. I just wanted to get the hands. Wait Sir William Coldstream, one of the most distinguished artists in the kingdom, has been painting Thompson's portrait for two years. And he still won't let him see it. You had a very, very little bit to your right, and fractioned up. That all right? Yes. But I start to sag a bit. But it fascinates me how. Uh, paintings can develop. I mean, to me, of course, they're quite uh, incomprehensible. Uh, as against a, a very good uh, photograph. Well, uh, very good photographs. Very useful thing, isn't it? I mean, it's, uh, they are very like people, I don't know. But, uh... Is this the lifeline? Yes. Is oh, that it? Oh, a very long one. This is uh, your sense of determination. The angle that you make with your... Uh, Oh, it is. Thumb. And how is that? It's, it's, it's <laughs> remarkable, actually. You would find that you cannot see through your um, fingers like I can. Oh, no, that's true. I am no. the person who cannot hold money. You are the one who can have millions. Oh, I see. There's no <laughs> leakage there, eh? <laughs> no leakage at all. <laughs> and this is a lifeline. Yes, definitely. Right around the there. Oh, yes. The very few people who will uh, live that long that you would. 
See, that's and Look at that. That's evidence. a relief. Your left hand, please. Thank you. Thank you. Great to you. Although Thompson is not noted for his charitable enterprises, he has established non-profit TV and journalism schools to help emerging nations. And you got Lord Thompson in. Right. Could you have Lord Thompson in now? 20 seconds. Studio. Stand by, everybody. Stand by, Grant. He will even sit as a yeah. guinea pig for the interview class. If you did take up Canadian citizenship again, would you keep your title? Oh, certainly. Mm -hmm. I've got it, and I'm sure going to hang on to it. Don't make any mistake about that. May I ask how much you pay Lord Snowden? No. Well, you might ask, but I'm going to tell you. Thompson enraged Fleet Street by hiring Lord Snowden. He denies it was a publicity stunt, but everybody turned up for Snowden's first day at work. We'll be back here in time for dinner on Wednesday night. Yeah. And he would like Lord Snowden to uh, be with us if, if he could come. Lord Snowden wants to take a picture of the president. It would be the simplest thing, I think, in the world for me to whistle them both up and yeah. they could join you at the end, and Tony could take pictures and it would be yeah. a very good... Uh, it would. Sure. Yes. Thompson prepares to interview the president of Czechoslovakia. And in talking about Germany, they will say that uh, they object to the German viewpoint that the Munich Agreement still exists. The Munich Agreement doesn't have to be revived. Really. So I'd keep these tender questions until you so reserve, softened right? him up, you yeah, know, or just keep him in reserve. Yes, huh? exactly. What do you know about Navarni? I'd be amazed to know. Well, I've heard that he's not a, um, a sort of gay, laughing type of man. He's, he's, rather, he's rather doer. No. I suppose that he'll start off in a very formal way, and then you'll use your usual uh, charm to to um, thaw him out a bit. Do you suppose you can pull his leg? Is it, oh, has, has he got any leg for pulling? Well, I certainly could do it with Khrushchev. Rachani Castle in Prague. Thompson is granted a rare interview with the remote and inaccessible Czech leader, Antonin Novotny. Thank you. I'm very pleased to Thank you. It's very kind, sir, of you to receive us like this and give us an opportunity of learning your views on some of the world problems. Thompson was friendly with Nikita Khrushchev. He has interviewed Kosygin and Tito. He operates a travel business to Eastern Europe and is trying to start a Rotary Club in Moscow. Territorial claims on Czechoslovakia. You must be aware of the fact that the British government uh, uh, thinks the Munich uh, Treaty has no validity. Abi, Abi. Critics call these interviews personal publicity stunts and say they are dangerously naive. Others say that perhaps unwittingly, Thompson is helping to thaw out the Cold War. They have to annul the treaty. We're confident that it will be in every respect. <laughs> yeah, no, look at then you will be a 50% capitalist. <laughs> The offices of the Czech national newspaper. You see, I am, I am fat enough to be to be a capitalist. Am I? Well, yes. I mean, the, the person. Yeah. <laughs> we always think of the capitalist, a big fat chap, you know, yes. and the communist, a little, the little, little thin fellow, you know. The capitalist, and, I mean, a big belly, a big cigar. belly, a big cigar. <laughs> yes. Oh, well, it's a good thing we can laugh at each other. That is real laughing. I see. Uh, and the actual robe is made of scarlet superfine cloth. Yes. Trimmed with gold oak leaf lace. Good fit. You've taken the measurement. Yes. Quite impulsive. 
these two bars are for Baron. Baron, yes. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah that seems alright. Seems to fit good enough. Well, it's been on the long side. I'm That's not going to buy another one. No, no. My son's got to wear this after me, you know, and he's about four inches taller than me. So yes. it'll fit him all right Absolutely. as well. I see. Well, Mr. Bailey, I'd be delighted to have you come in and we, we can talk about it. Uh, frankly, I, before you do so, I'd like to be perfectly uh, blunt about my, my attitude towards magazines in Canada. Frankly, we're not too enthusiastic. Thompson's only son and heir, Kenneth, who operates the North American Empire. Oh, oh, I think we'd be even less interested in that. A, na a national magazine couldn't, couldn't interest us much less. Look, there are easier ways to make a living, really. Thompson bought his first newspaper, the Timmins Press, in 1934. It's still making money for him in northern Ontario. What is it? Just the one cut line right here. Okay. Dick, let's see that one again, please. You're not taught anything really, are you? Well, You're copy. You don't have you don't have some gung ho editor up there saying this is no good. I suggest you do it this way. This is how it should be done. They don't sit down on with some you. Of they... the Thompson papers you well, well, not in Cornwall. Big papers like the Toronto Star are full of former Thompson men. As a young kid, you have the opportunity to learn. Certainly, you're employed by a lot of meatheads in, in many cases. No question about that. But you do have the opportunity to learn, and, and where else w would you have it? Then? You learn the whole idea of a newspaper there, and you do rub up against other young, hungry guys on their way up. Who else in the world would want to publish a paper in Prince Albert, Saskatchewan? Only Roy Thompson can keep the damn thing alive. And it's the same with Aurelia or any of those places. What I want to do is get you in front of this here, re this uh, actual sign, so we can see Timmins in the background. Um, can I ask you a favor not to wear your sunglasses till I take it? Just so people will recognize you as one of the strikers. Good, now I'll take one more. Sir, can you move your sign out, please? I'm Timmy Daily Press calling you. Uh, Mr. Riley, I heard a rumor, which I do want to check with you. Um, are you planning any type of picketing at the town hall this afternoon? You know that at the council meeting that's being held at 5 o'clock? You do. Fine. Thank you very much. Bye. There's going to be a demonstration at town hall tonight. All a mass picketing at town hall, and they want the residents to walk through the picket line. It's not bankrupt. It's ridiculous. In northern Ontario, Thompson sat as an alderman and once ran for mayor. Issues haven't changed much. Does the new school need a pool? But it's what we can afford. What was good enough for Johnny 30 years ago was fine. If Lester Pearson never swam in his life, or Alexander the Great, he conquered the world, he never took a bath in his life, why should my kid swim? Maybe the design has to be changed. Cheryl Richardson is the senior reporter in Timmins. She's been with the paper five months. The pay is low, the turnover high. The empire was built on a tight budget really unhappy and just give him something give him two dollars and fifty cents a week more just say no that's over the old budget i recall on one occasion uh, i think i was getting ten cents an inch for everything published that i'd written and uh, thompson was sufficiently budget minded even uh, that long ago that he made a, a hundred mile trip to see me and uh, negotiated a reduction to eight cents an inch and persuaded me it was in my best interest <laughs> The son of a Toronto barber, he headed north in 1928. He wanted to sell radios, but there wasn't a station, so he started one. The North Bay merchants bought up airtime. These were depression days, but the North had gold, and tourists were pouring in to see the Dion quintuplets. Thompson began to build a string of small town enterprises. Soon he was saying that the sweetest music in the world was the sound of a spot commercial at 10 bucks a whack. It's true, it's true. So be with the in crowd this year by shopping at Adams Men's and Boys Wear, 181 Main Street West in downtown North Bay. We'll keep you looking your very best. The outside world was not yet aware of Thompson. The mighty Beaverbrook described him as a little guy who owns a lot of little papers. Then in 1953, with one dramatic stroke, Thompson joined the Giants. He bought one of the oldest and most dignified newspapers in the English-speaking world, the Scotsman of Edinburgh.
Rosemary Smith and the Hillman Imp, lying in fifth place. Uh, yeah. Grant, do you need to have a Conway picture? Aye. I want him for the front. I want him for the front. Can you manage without? To the surprise of many, the quality of the paper didn't suffer. Thompson started Scottish television and began to expand in the UK. On a facility trip to Northern Ireland a few years ago to Belfast, Lord Thompson got a free ride over there. He disappeared for the morning, turned up for the free lunch, but he disappeared when the boring speeches started. And he turned up again for the free ride back, and we all been given a little rug, two guinea, three guinea rug, as the sort of mementos of the day. And there was Lord Thompson clutching his two guinea, three guinea rug, getting a free ride back. There was no car waiting for him at London Airport. He shared the bus with the rest of us. Um, and I thought this was remarkable. When I said this to one of the other fellows with, uh, with us on the trip. He said, you don't know half the story. Uh, what do you think he was doing in the afternoon? Buying, Buying the Belfast Telegraph for two and a half million pounds. Nineteen sixty one. It is rumored that Thompson is about to take over Autumn's Press, which includes two national papers and many leading magazines. But this is the big time. He meets his match in Cecil Harmsworth King of the Daily Mirror. I was looking at television one night, which I don't often do, and there was uh, Roy Thompson and Christopher Chancellor on, on, on the wire saying that they had uh, formed an indissoluble marriage. And they smirked at each other, and um, somebody, that was the interviewer, said, but aren't you afraid that somebody might make a counter bid? And Roy said, nobody else has the money. Mr. Thompson, is this deal completely signed, sealed and collected? There have been rumours today that the Mirror might come in with another bid. Well, I have no knowledge of any such a development. I don't think it happens. I notice today the Mirror specifically denied that they were interested, and I would accept that. The deal is certainly uh, signed, but there are details that still have to be worked out, small details. Well, really, I mean, this was a bit much. So <laughs> I lifted the telephone and rang my chaps up and said, no, this, this can't be allowed to pass. I mean, this really is too much. Uh, it so was a challenge. Yes, so we waded in and um, demolished Thompson and his indissoluble marriage. Oh, yes, we were rather sad about it, but I will be fair with Lord Thompson. Once the thing is over, he completely forgets about it. He puts it absolutely behind him. He does really, literally, mm -hmm. yes. Whereas other men would grieve about it, he doesn't. Well, it says here, two separate programs in Arabic, French, and English. Well, now, if we put the word commercial before programs, that's all we need. Well, do you think we should have our lawyer, you should have our lawyer with you? Thompson turns his attention to television interests in the Middle East. Paragraph 8 and 10. Well, of course, you'll ha have to make that clear, because that's very important. Yeah. Well, we get a half of a half, half of 25%. Of yeah, but we've got the control over all of it. Yeah, we have the oh, vote, yeah. you know, but oh, yeah. I mean the profit-wise, we yeah. get 62 and a half percent. Yeah. See, before, it was uh, cockeyed. Thompson's staff includes such men as Sir Timothy Bly, private secretary to two British prime ministers. Well, you've, you've cut that away down. What about uh, this business transfer to of their videotape machines? That's without consideration. Um, I don't want this put in. No. Because, in fact, um, they belong to Teleorion. So we'll have to polish this up a little we'll more. We'll have to... Uh, do a little bit of what the French call Ecke Vok. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, you can do that over. Yeah, I can do that over. Um, <laughs> I've read it. Excuse me, there's a call on from Paris, Sir Timothy. He said you wanted to be told. Um, okay. Yes, I, had to, I think I'd better take the call. Yeah, you better take the call. No, I was just thinking, when Tim's talking to you about the, the Lebanon, Roy, if, if you shouldn't now fix your, your visit to go down and see the chic of uh, Adebay. We'll see if they think I should go right away. Mm -hmm. Jordan's just on the point of uh, making, a making a decision. Just the one other thing, finally, the uh, thing in Liberia, that you put in a herd of cattle. Oh, yeah. Whether we Excuse me again, sir. Mr. Rizek is getting restless. He wants if you want to. Listen, you're He's right in the middle of this day. They asked me to come in twice, sir. That's Never why mind. Just wait. I remember the first thing he told me. I almost fell to the floor. I took him in the list of staff. It was the very first morning, actually. I'd been in about five minutes. They said, wow, he said, who are those? Secretaries. Well, he said, well, one person can do the job or two, that's the way we operate. So that was it. I almost fell to the flaming floor. Albert Mackey, a deposed Scottish editor. Uh, was the firing a shock to you? Was it handled pleasantly? Well, it was handled pleasantly, but it was still a shock. I'm sure that uh, so far as uh, 
Roy Thompson was concerned, as say, pulling your teeth as to many a dentist, it was a, an entirely painless extraction, but it wasn't painless to me. My wife had prepared for my lunch that day a, a haggis, which she still in, had in the pot, when I came home for lunch and came home to tell her, and uh, the, the shock was so great to her that the haggis never came out of the pot. So I've always said that last Saturday was the day our haggis died. Eskdale in the south of Scotland, ancestral home of the Thompsons. He donates an organ to the village church. There's a tremendous range in it. Uh, you don't realize with its, from its size, do no, you? No, no, that's true. They can get a lot into a small size now. And it fits very well with the whole decor of the yeah. church. That's very helpful. Thompson's ancestors included sheep stealers and border raiders. They robbed both Scots and English with equal enthusiasm. today a most distinguished visitor, Lord Thompson of Fleet. Would you like to know something of Canada? I'm sure he'll be quite willing to spare you a yes, few minutes indeed. to tell them. Come away then. Please, sir, could you tell me anything about maple sugar? You know, they, they get maple syrup out of a maple tree. Uh, in the spring, the sap runs up a tree, you know, it does in all trees, and they drill a hole in these maple trees and then they put a little spigot in there, and then they hang a bucket on it. And the sap, uh, the sap comes up to the tree and runs out of the bucket and into, uh, uh, out of the spigot and into the bucket. Please, sir, uh, are you very good at sums? Yes. I think that's a tremendously important thing. If you're going into business, you should certainly be able to, to figure. There's six. How many beads are there, there Fiona? Eight. Right, how good do you know? Good for you. This is two and five. Now, Fiona, supposing <coughs> I do that, how many have I got now? Seven. Why? Because there's three left behind. That's it. Five. All right. No, no. You no. got six. How many have you here, Fiona? How many? Try it again now. Five. That's, That's the way. Zero. Lord Lyon, King of Arms, controller of Scottish heraldry. So you would now wish me to say what we came here to do in relation to the arms of Lord Thompson of Fleet. Now, if you could just wait, before you begin your statement, sir, we just put a marker on it to get it synchronized. Yeah. That's like... Slight... like scene 42, roll 12. And if you could just fix the camera, sir. Historians observe that the Scottish social system is scientifically a family I one. Better, I think we'd better, better start <laughs> again and tell them to, to put that thing off, definitely. Hello? Put it off. I'll speak to the next time. Yes. To disconnect. Them. OK, sir, if you'd like to start again. Right. Historians observe that the Scottish social system is scientifically a family one. Roy Thompson's shepherd ancestors from Tweedale clearly belong to this family whose representative, Thompson of their ilk, is now dormant. But Roy Thompson is very much awake. So Roy Thompson, thus, was a sight, a beaver blowing a horn, gaily bedecked with a baldric of Thompson tart, around his shoulders, holding it up, which is the way that humans, if not beavers, put on their horns. From at the top of the achievement, the motto of Lord Thompson, never a backward step.
I suppose the beaver is a very unusual animal in heraldry. We have beavers and bits of beavers in connection with the arms of celebrated Canadians. They appear as supporters, they appear doing all kinds of things in crests. Sometimes there is only half a beaver coming out of the wreath. But here we have the full horn. The horn of publication, this is... Uh... Ah, you now see the purpose and the significance people, of the beaver. Some people uh, thought it was the horn of and plenty. And the horn. <laughs> yes, some people thought it was the horn of plenty. <laughs> well, uh, I don't think I would have liked to make it look like a cornucopia when what it is dispensing is information and uh, information fact and pleasant reading as well. The king of communications is told he should meet the philosopher of communication, the controversial Marshall McLuhan. Executive on the whole subject of communication. Yeah. You know, well, of course, just from what I read about this, um, the dominant medium of communication at any age alters the way people think, feel, act, and react. Television is the, thus returning the viewers to the picture thinking of primitive men. Of course, I think this is all pie in the sky myself. He says, he says, uh, the, the Bell Telephone Company don't know the business they're in. He says, they've never asked themselves the question, well, I have a pretty damn good idea what business. <laughs> 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 and I would think they have too. Dr. McLuhan arrives. But you say the Bell Telephone, for instance, uh, uh, they say the Bell Telephone Company has never asked itself what business it's in. No. Uh, it has never asked what sort of an image do people have of their bodies and, them, and their, are their friends as a result of the telephone. If the new image... But how would, how would that affect your profit? Frankly, I'm well, very interested in profit. Well, I mean, the uh, body image. You see, for example, the body image is changing so rapidly right now that people are beginning to have their doubts about motor cars. The American for... 30 years had uh, an image of himself as a uh, part of a, a motor car. Now he's losing this image. And uh, the motor car industry is on the skids. Now you see, really, to absorb what you're telling me, I need it written out. I'd have oh. to read it. Okay. <laughs> this is the talk of a literate man. The literate man was all for absorbing things. The new sort of electric man doesn't want to absorb well, things. You mean that in the future people are not going to be as literate? Oh, indeed, yes. Literacy is on the skids. <laughs> oh, yes. Now I understand why you got the reputation. Oh, I can no. see that. No, you, but you're a shocker, I, isn't he? I, 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 look, <laughs> I'm quite fascinated with his view. He's way out, you know, I mean, way talking way about these things. At least unless he... If he isn't, then by God, I am. Well, the, only, the only thing that uh, impresses me is he went to Cambridge. <laughs> 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 I've got to think. The thing about Thompson is everybody thinks he's such a nice sort of... Uh, outspoken fellow who says he only wants to make money and he hasn't any opinions of his own and everybody rather likes him. Ooh. Now, in a, in a way, I think he's a, much more dangerous in some important respects than Beaverbrook ever oh. was. <laughs> Thompson is considered dangerous because he operates papers strictly for profit. It is profitable to cater to majority opinion. It is not his business to worry about minorities. He would turn a conservative paper into a socialist paper if it would sell more copies. We know enough from social science research now, I mean, underline that, we really know enough from it to know that if you have one major organ of mass media for communication of opinions, and if that consistently puts the point of view that is a majority point of view, then the minority notions, the idea of a possible other point of view will die. Most of his small papers are bland and suburban, causing no offense to the local establishment. Those in the American South have been accused of segregationist sympathies. You wouldn't like Roy Thompson, why? I like, want to own a no, hundred newspapers in all parts of the country so that he can pull out a drawer and look at all their balance, balance sheets and tell you, as he's told me, that some little paper in Canada is spending more on metal or on paper or ink than some paper in north of Scotland is. How manifestly newspapers have to pay their way. But this shouldn't be the be-all and end-all of their existence. When The Guardian began to lose a lot of readers over Suez, Scott walked into Hetherington and said, look, 
We're losing readers, but don't you take any notice of that. I'll look after that so far as I can. You go on saying what you believe. Well, I just don't think that in those circumstances, uh, Thompson would have that sort of approach. If it went on long, if it was just a very no, temporary he... thing, he'd say, all right, but if it began to lose readers yes, on an I issue think... of principle, he would say, well, I'm sorry, old boy, but really we want somebody who understands this public better than you do. Earl McLaughlin, dear Earl, see, I don't think you have enough pictures of weddings and of children, babies particularly. This is something that particularly appeals to women, and uh, we must appeal primarily to them. Incidentally, I don't think you have enough marriages and deaths. I'm sure many more of these take place than are covered by the Post. If you had the chance to be like Roy Thompson... I'd, I'd like to be like him in the sense of owning the same number of papers, but then I would then uh, bash away at all the various things in which I believe. <laughs> however uh, tiresome you might find them. Thompson doesn't really have any opinions politically to peddle at all, except, I think, a kind of robust sort of Khrushchev view of capitalism, uh, that it is still some kind of a jungle, and it ought to be left as a jungle, so that chaps like him can get on all right in it. Hello, Roy, how are you? Hello, Jack. How are you? Good, how are it's good you? to see you. <laughs> oh, oh, okay. Give me your hat. Yeah. Gee, Here's your hat. What's your yeah? Listen, Jesus, we never stop those corny jokes, Roy. <laughs> yeah. Thompson's yeah. oldest and closest friend is Jack Kent Cook. Cook was Thompson's protege in the North. Known as a shrewd operator and hustling super salesman, he has gone on to become a multimillionaire in Los Angeles. What times we've had together! <laughs> Some years ago, they parted bitterly when Cook cut Thompson out of a radio deal in Ottawa. There has been a recent reconciliation. Or there'd be the end of Lord Thompson of Fleet right here now. Remember the time we went to New York? Is Jim Barlow still alive? Yeah, yeah. Remember He's when? pretty old. He bought one thing, a bathroom plunger. <laughs> Remember, he said he couldn't buy them in Timmins. <laughs> said he couldn't buy them in Timmins, Ontario. Oh, my goodness. Yeah. And those dirty magazines, you remember? We put them in his bag and the customs man opened them and he says, you can't bring that stuff in the cabinet. <laughs> you remember up in Sudbury? Bill Mason, the most cantankerous man, I guess, that ever lived in or out of the newspaper business, said to the staff, line up. He marched down the line and he stops up and he says, everybody from here on, fired. Yeah. <laughs> you yeah, remember that, that Roy? I do, I do. There were good old days. We didn't have any money and we had to work without money, but... That all helped it along, didn't it? It just honed our senses. It was a good exercise yeah. for the future, wasn't it? Good to see you again. It's wonderful to see you. <laughs> now, is there anything else we can do for you? <laughs> and tomorrow night, he's gone to dinner at Black Tie, so he'll be staying in town overnight. Um, no, he's got the black tie, hasn't he? Uh, he probably wants a spare shirt. Mm hmm. The Dorchester Hotel London, where one of the biggest birthday parties of the year is being held for the 85th birthday of Lord Beaverbrook, the host of the evening, Lord Thompson of Fleet. And since this is a party in honor of one of the greatest Canadians of the 20th century, the four Indian chiefs are in attendance. They were specially brought from Canada for the occasion, and when Lord Beaverbrook arrives, they will form one half of the Guard of Honor. The other half will, naturally, be mounted. Four troopers of the Royal Canadian Mounted Police. No one can mistake the significance of the symbol in the foyer, least of all the guest of honor. Lord Beaverbrook arrives at the Dorchester with his wife, but for the time being, she leaves him. This is strictly a stack. He was a very sick man at this time. How soon after this was it that he died? Uh, about three weeks. Mm -hmm. Oh, yes, he was really dying. He was doomed. He knew that, too. A word of advice to our friend Lord Thompson of Fleet. It is this, that he should be guided by my wisdom and gain benefit by my experience. He should begin a new career at once. Become an apprentice as quickly as possible. Give up those newspapers of his and take to politics or philanthropy or something or other. So long as he ceases to trouble our little group of newspaper proprietors. 
I, let me just say one thing about Beerbrook, and this is a bad thing to say about it, but it's something I, tr I truly believe. I think. Beaverbrook was, in balance, a force not for good in our society. Oh. You might even say a force for evil. I feel very strongly about this. Oh, I, don't I think, in balance, Thompson is proving to be and continues to be, in balance, in net, a force for good in our society. Is the success of these two Canadians a coincidence? A calamity, sir. <laughs> in one way, a calamity. I think Beaverbrook was an evil man who had a pernicious influence on the press and the politics of this country. I think this uh, would have been, uh, uh, this country would have been better off if he'd stayed where he came from. Another thing that I dislike about Reba is the way he, has, he treated many men in his life, how he destroyed them. He destroyed them not on ordinary commercial grounds, but as a for, on a matter of whim. Now, with Thompson, I would imagine it's a strictly dollars and cents deal. You produce, you get paid. <laughs> You know what he does? Th this fellow holds a meeting in Montreal and sends, uh, what's his name, uh, to go and attend the meeting. Says everything went off uh, satisfactorily. How the hell does he know whether it's satisfactory or not? He says now that he refuses to transfer the shares to, from TTI. He thinks it's easy. See, you fellas here, you, you don't know a goddamn thing about it. And the thing is, is uh, uh, he just handles things as he bloody well likes. He doesn't know what's right and what's wrong. I can wait until his committee... Finishes. Thompson uh, operates through a network of committees. He sits on none of them. So it's just a question this is international television. Sarawak. We have peace well, in Sarawak. No? Indeed, that's why I felt uh, there was a little bit more interest on our part. But if all the troops are going out, who's going to be able to afford to buy a television receiver? Saudi Arabia is not very much. I want to report to the board at this stage. Um, I had good meetings in Saudi with the minister, with the crown prince, with Prince Sultan. Sheikh Ghazawi arrives here tomorrow. Um, I flew up with him yesterday from um, Jeddah to Beirut. Thompson hires teams of high-powered, tough-minded executives to keep his money turning over. Some of his executives are minor shareholders, but Thompson and his family own 70% of everything. He sits on none of the committees, it's true, but he knows of every decision and must approve all major deals. The Magazine and Book Committee. So the proposal is the acquisition of console books, which could mean ultimately a major investment by Thompson's in the paperback field, both because it will be profitable in its own right and in order to safeguard our existing investments, and secondly, to tell you of the appointment of Fisher and to ask any comments or questions. What actual advantage is there in taking over this imprint as compared with creating a new imprint of our own? It's a repository of quite a lot of rights um, to titles. They may not necessarily be the titles that one would have chosen, but there are some perfectly good titles that can be repackaged and, uh, and successfully sold. In other words, a bread and butter yeah. operation yeah. while yeah. the yeah. thing Exactly. The general thinking is that console should be absorbed by an overall imprint, and we should just use console as fodder to get us through these two to three years. The next um, item is Illustrated Carpenter and Builder, the proposed acquisition, which you have a very short paper. They did not approach us, we went to them, and it took some time to get them even to this stage. Originally, they were talking about a purchase price based on eight times the current profitability which we rejected, and we've now talked them down to a figure of between five and six. I think it's more likely to be five and a half or six times. 
They've also said point blank that uh, they wouldn't be interested in less than a hundred thousand pounds. If the marketing division had produced a marketing appraisal of it, that would be helpful too. They, to the best of my knowledge, have not produced an appraisal of it. They have considered it and discussed it with us. Well, let them get on and produce a, a, their own opinion of the, uh, of the acquisition. You say they're in favour. Let's have the reasons why they're in favour. Right, thank you. I think we all want a drink after this. Yes, I don't. <laughs> Uh, I hope you weren't counting on a lot of selection. No, no, no. It, uh, I'm not too keen particular about that, as long as they're all right. Normally, uh, 6 dollars We're on sale at the present time and a third off. Oh, well, that appeals to me. You have a nylon zipper yeah. buttoning on the front so sure. that you're not struggling to no, get them up no, and down. No. That's good. That's right? fine. All right. How much is it again? Five ninety-five, and today on sale at three ninety-seven or eight, eh? Three ninety-eight. You're ahead of me. Thompson's wife died in 1951, and he lives alone. But in a deeper sense, he has always been alone. As a boy, he was half blind and ungainly. As a man, he has locked himself up in work. If, as some say, he is incomplete and one-dimensional, he is certainly not in the least unhappy. He enjoys the company of successful men. But even in a crowd, he is essentially alone. Mr. David Montague. Oh, yes. Oh, hello, David. Nice How are you? you? Good, nice good to, to see, see you. you. Very nice to David, see you. David, uh, you know she Sheikh Najib? Uh, David Montague. Uh, Mr. Morphy, Chairman of Canard. Mr. Mully? But uh, I come from Billy Graham's, listening to Billy Graham, was what's called a working breakfast this morning. And the, and, the, and the members of the House of Commons had been there all night and had been dividing and then went to hear, hear Billy Graham, which is really Yes, yes, yes. yes. I just noted too. I know, they went straight to my decisions. And I see the place where they were breaking the house. Hey, Phil, uh, it's Jack O'Hagan, is it? Joe. It's Joe. Phil. Joe. 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 Thompson holds frequent office luncheons. Today, he welcomes a new member of the House of Lords. Congratulations, uh, yeah. Bill, on your recent appointment. I'm, I'm sure you'll like it there. You know, it may not be democracy, but it's damn nice. You don't have to worry, <laughs> you don't have to worry about getting re-elected. See? I, I enjoy it very much. I'd like you to, each to accept my compliments. One of these books one of our recent publications, The Art of Margot Fontaine. So it's about there. And this is next week's Sunday Times magazine, if you care to take it. I'll give you a little preview. <laughs> I don't know. I was there just, I was at 39. Yeah, but don't you think it has something to do with sex? <laughs> Thompson entertains the females of Fleet Street. He neither smokes nor drinks, but has always liked eating and the company of women. By the way, do you notice that we're emulating Playboy this week? And I want you to know that I knew nothing about it till I got the copy in my desk, so any criticism should not be directed at me. Do you think I could get the original of this? <laughs> It'll be up in every bar, I see. Worse than every paper. Oh, my God, turn that over quick. <laughs> the hanging hair, the, the, the belly button. I'm well, so tired of it. Yeah. I want something to well, say. Well, ladies, it's been a pleasure to have you. Really well. uh, this is the, uh, the, the art of Margot Fontaine. Well, your great problem with all these meals and things that you yes, have every day, so you should be around 190 and you're hitting 208. That's far too much. What are you going to do about it? I'm going to stop eating. Well, I'm glad to hear that. <laughs> Seems to me I've heard that before. Yeah, you yeah. will probably hear it again, yeah. too. Right, I haven't got the detail yet. As soon as I get it, I'll give you a tinkle. Thank you. Bye.
Hello. You want the table plan for tomorrow? Have we got the staff for the hats and coats? Yes, I'm all right. Yes. And the Prime Minister's private detective, he normally has lunch here. Is that yes, all fixed up? That's all arranged. That's fine. Thank you. That's OK. So we're putting him that in. So there's room at the other end, actually. Well, what I thought was uh, you could put one at each end. Yes. You, know, four well, all, so. you could put four all together. Yeah. Two, two at each end of one side and two at each end. Well, there's room for one at one end at the moment because we've got Trevor Lloyd Hughes at the end down here, so near the door. That's right. Well, now then so we can have two Carroll. more on the other side. Two more? Sir. Well, one on each end. Well, that was I mean, sir. We've got Nicholas Cow. Um, Trevor Lloyd, he was coming. He is on one end. Yeah, but look, at there's two sides to the table. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Well, how many do you want, sir? Four altogether oh. that we haven't got on. There's one is the secretary that's coming, and there could be three more. Look at, see well, what I mean? Yes, I know, sir, but who are you going to ask, Craig? Really? Well, that's what we The plan is ready, out. sir. The thing's been done. The menu oh, we don't need. we don't need any names on it. Look, we can put somebody there, somebody there, they Somebody haven't got there. room here, so they asked me, particularly this morning, not to put anybody else on the ends, because that's why we had to shift this chappy from there to there. I put him here, sir. The thing has been printed now upstairs in the studio. No, well, uh, the printing don't matter. We don't need to care about those four. They would be superfluous to the rest. But that's but 32, however, sir. We've never had 32 at a lunch. No, we find that if they're at the end, it gives these two people somebody to speak to. Hold your pigments, be sure. Prime Minister, sir. Hello. Roy, I'm very sorry about that. You got my message. Perfectly all right, yes. We're going to do things perfectly all right. Do you know this gentleman? Now, look, you know these ambassadors perhaps better than I do. His Royal Highness, the Thai ambassador. How are you? How are you? Oh, is, he, is he telling me? Yeah, it's, uh, they're making a film of my life. Ah, yeah. Film yeah. To meet uh, those uh, shakes down there, must be very small. All right. My lord, gentlemen, luncheon is served. I just want to say that uh, we're greatly honored today to have the Prime Minister as our guest of honor. I'm sure we all... Uh, we have, of course, I won't attempt to pronounce the names because some of these names I find it extremely difficult to pronounce. But we have, of course, the cream of the ambassadors in this country. There are only several missing and uh, they, I believe, are attending some uh, Western European uh, meeting in Germany today? Brussels. Brussels. In Brussels, that's right. And they, they all were sorry that that was the case. There were several in that case. Now, I might say that, that you don't often get an opportunity to have the Prime Minister you can ask him a question and see his response. Sometimes, you know, what he doesn't say is more informative of what he does say. <laughs> so, uh, you're, you're quite uh, at liberty to uh, say it. I'm very generous with your time. <laughs> but uh, I might say, too, that th everything's within these four walls. There's nothing going outside here at all. I mean, nothing is reported. So, you're quite safe. Nothing will go back to Moscow, Mr. Smirnovsky, so you're perfectly safe. And the same happens to Washington, too, doesn't it? May I thank you for inviting me here, and again, apologizing for arriving late, but it is a pleasure to meet you again and your colleagues here, uh, and also to be sitting at what must be the largest gathering of the diplomatic corps outside the Delarue dinner. <laughs> There are two superpower nations really in the world today, America and Russia. Does he does he feel that a meeting of the those other nations, other than those two super nations, could have any beneficial effect? Roy, you mustn't bring your Canadian inferiority complex to this country. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> now we have here one of our new publications, a book here, which I'd like you to accept each of you to accept on your way out with my compliments. It's uh, Margot Fontaine. Quite non-political. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> uh, next week, Sunday Times magazines. You're all going to get a preview, you see, of, of the uh, magazines for next week. Well, I think that's all, gentlemen. Thank you again. Thank you, Thank you very much, Harold, for coming. What's going to happen uh, when uh, there is no right time? So what's going to happen to the empire? Does it all um, fall to pieces or what? Now, his grandson, I was uh, amazed to discover when I was doing some doing this research in the tax story, had his name done for Eton. Uh, presumably, it was being made into a nice um, English gentleman. David Thompson, only grandson, and an heir to more than $300 million. Do you have any idea uh, about a, a career at all? I might want to run the newspaper business. Yeah? Are you interested in newspapers? Oh, yes, a little. Mm -hmm. And, of course, I'd like to see him go to Eton. 
Yeah, I know you would. See, but it's only uh, about seven miles from uh, Oliver and Arches, and he could uh, come home. Uh, On the weekend. Yeah. Yes, and I don't know even uh, whether they let you out at night or not. I mean, there may be a lot of schools in Britain that would be as fine, or I don't know, perhaps even finer than Upper Canada, but there would be very few of any that he would enjoy more than he. It's a wonderful school, isn't it? Yes. You like it there, David, eh? Yes, I, I'm not, I, I don't want to go to England. Right? Yeah, so you don't much. want to go. <laughs> oh, well. I'm afraid you won't have much choice. The only remaining question, will the Thompson dynasty endure? I wouldn't care with the lineup of lieutenants that Thompson has to have to succeed to his throne. Anyway, Thompson said if he can't take it with him, he's not going to go.